consider Jesus. We're going to continue to consider him, another aspect of Christ, found in Revelation 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. This is what Brother Aaron is going to be ministering to us, he who has the sharp sword with two edges. Back in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, it references the sword again. And when John saw Christ, he said he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. So we see here the sword proceeds from the mouth of Christ. Yeah. So we're going to liken it now to his word, the word of Christ being like a sword. It is fitting that Jesus gave this illustration of himself because he is the word of God. And uh, when you think about the word of God and the work that it does, we're reminded that it is compared with a sword. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So examine in your mind Jesus' words when he was here in the earth even. What effect, what did Jesus' word do when he spoke it, even when he was here in the earth? A couple of examples, one from John 10. The Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because thou wast being a man, made thyself God. So we see here the contention that the enemies of Christ had with him wasn't for anything that he did. It wasn't for a good work, but it was what he said. What he said pierced these men. It was like they were cut to the heart, like the men that Stephen spoke to. Again in Luke chapter 4, they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. So the word was with power and could not be resisted. Christ's word. Here he used his word to separate evil from among the people. So the words of Christ, they are penetrating and they are piercing. They will make very evident separations and divisions, much more accurate than we could make on our own. We wouldn't even know the defi defining line to make the separation at. The example given is the dividing of soul and spirit. Not many can make the division between those two things on their own without the word of Christ. He is wielding this sword, his word, with intention and precision. One of his intentions in wielding his word is to make separations and distinctions within our own heart to us. It's to make evident things that are within us. Think of the division between the old and the new man, just for one example. Without the word of Christ coming to bear on the truth of the old and new man, we would have a hard time grasping what it means, what the differentiations were between the two, how to identify the one and to throw off another. But when his word goes forth, it is like a sword that makes a clear line of separation so we can see the difference between the two. His word can make our thoughts and intentions evident to us. So when we think about Jesus in the midst of his churches, as we will this weekend, we want to take heed to his word that he speaks. Because it is like a sword that will define many things for us. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and let it do its work to divide intentions and separate thoughts and discern natures for us all. Because we know that his intention is to purify and perfect us. And all of these things he's showing us is to make us clean and pure. So we'll continue to consider that. From fire to sword. We, we need to know that the Savior works with these, these kinds of things. He, he comes with fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. So he, he really means business. So what if, there, what if there was a man with unrivaled power and authority and unequaled wisdom, no competition at all, and it was obvious that no one could compete or, or um, up, uh, stand above him in any of these, any of these areas? How would, we, 
expect a man like that to speak? How would we, would we, would we expect to hear things like, if you wouldn't mind, or in my opinion, he just wouldn't use phrases like that. They're not needed. Not when he has all power, all wisdom, all authority. He, how would we expect people to listen when he speaks? <clears throat> what would a man speak like if he, was, if he had been in the beginning with God? How would that man speak? If, what, if all, if, what if you could find a man that, that all things were made through him? Would you be interested in what that man said? What about a man for whom all things were made? All things were made by him and for him. That means he's using all things in the interest of his church. Would you, be, would you have an inclination to listen to what that man says? And not only this, but the same man, he... Uh, by him, all things consist. That means things are holding together, not flying apart into, into chaos because he's upholding all things by the word of his power. Would you listen if that man spoke to you? He has. This man doesn't read commentaries and he doesn't write editorial. He speaks like with a two-edged sword. A sharp two-edged sword. He says things like this. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. This man who has all power, authority, and wisdom, he says, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. It's no wonder the people observed. He doesn't speak like other men speak. Men in high places in government today can cause dramatic changes and trends with what they say, intended or unintended. The chairman of the Federal Reserve has caused dramatic moves up and down in financial sectors by what he said, by words, just by what he said, and masses of people respond by buying and selling and moving and trending and changing changing directions just because of what one man said, the chairman of the Fed, the Federal Reserve. Lawmakers have caused buying frenzies and shortages of guns and ammunition by saying gun control. And markets drastically and quickly change by what that man said, just by his word. And it's not the man that owns all the gun manufacturers or all the ammunition plants but he's a man in a place of power. And what he says has a lot of weight. What the doctor says to us after the test results can weigh heavy or can cause joy. What the judge says from the bench can dictate the rest of a person's life by what he says, his words. What the boss says to us in the annual review can change or end our working responsibilities. Yeah. What we say to our children can either nurture or discourage with words. What we say to our husband or wife can be like washing feet or it can be like coals of fire. Words that are spoken. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How many people have been confused by their own inward motions? I don't know why I did that. I don't know what came over me. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm so confused. I'm confounded. Why, why, why? How, how, how? The Word of God can discern the thoughts and intents of your heart. How else would you go about uh, dividing between soul and spirit. Some people say there's no division at all. It's just using different words for the same thing. But if the word of God makes a division between the two, then it's because there are two. There's soul and spirit. 
See, your soul can identify with your body or with your inner man. Just in a moment of time, you can be, you can be in, in a high mood or in a low mood. You can be joyful or you can be burdened. That's, that's your soul. It can make this quick transition back and forth. Your spirit doesn't, praise God. Yes. And the, whole, the, the word of God can divide between soul and spirit. And that's a division that, solely, that sorely needs made. If, we're, if we have to put off and put on, then there's something that needs to be put off and something that needs to put on, and you don't want to get them mixed up and being put on what needs to be put off and be putting off what needs to be put on. You've got to divide, divide between soul and spirit, between the thoughts and intents of the heart. <clears throat> there are those walking in the world today who just want to tell or hear some new thing. They just like to, you know, just it's just kind of a hobby, you know, just just hearing new words and hearing kind of a kind of a new spin on things. And you just listen to the news all day. That would drive me crazy to listen to the news. But people like to tell or hear some some new thing. There, every man will give account for idle words. It's possible to just speak into the air. Just to say something that just just doesn't mean anything. Just idle words. It just speaks out just like, just like smoke. It just com comes out and dissipates and it's gone. Idle words. Some, pe some men go about to deceive with vain words. People have asked for smooth words to be spoken to them. Preach unto us or speak unto us smooth things. Now don't, don't tell us these hard things. People said about Jesus, he, he, he speaks hard things. Who can receive what he says? Well, we, we have received what he says. But some have asked for smooth things. Some, some men speak great swelling words of vanity. <laughs> it's like their words are really bigger than what's inside of them. There are some that go about with feigned words and some who speak with enticing words. Some have used flattering words, and some have used malicious words. These, these are all inspired phrases. The Holy Spirit talks about words in this way, words that men have spoken. There are some things that are said that are dangerous. That's, that's malicious words, or vain words, or enticing words. Selfish men make fair speeches with good words. That is, I'll say what needs to be said in order to procure favor, in order to procure a following, in order to procure a paycheck, what have you. That's good, fair speeches with good words. And then there are also those who go about to trouble you with words, subverting your souls. Paul talked about a condition where people's faith was actually overthrown by what someone said. They said that, that the resurrection's passed already. What does, that, what does that do? It takes people's hope from them. It, st it stole their hope yeah. by, by the words that were spoken. You know, somebody came up with this, this uh, catchy little phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Oh, yes, they will. A harsh word. Spoken in hatred or disregard can cause deep wounds and sorrow. A word spoken in due season can minister comfort and refresh, refresh the weary soul. So let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. The brethren, we've come to a Savior who speaks, his words are like a sharp, two-edged sword. I, 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 can, um, I can assume that you have had a similar experience like I just, just had. It was a perfect example. I'm searching for words. <laughs> what, the way I said that, it wasn't quite like I wanted. Or I thought that's the way I wanted to say it, but when it came out, it just that wasn't really as good as I thought it was going to be. Because my words can be really dull. His are sharp. No man speaks like this man speaks. If a man of war walked in those doors with a sharp sword drawn into this room, he would have everyone's attention. But that man is here. A sharp, 
two-edged sword. That the Savior comes with a sword reveals not only the nature of his word and his work, but also the truth of the human condition. He comes with a sword. If he came as the great grantor of wishes and dreams, he would not have come with a sword. If he came in order to bolster our self-esteem and to teach goal-setting skills, he would not have needed to come with a sword. The danger of living in this world, this world that lies totally in wickedness, the whole world lies in wickedness, calls for a sword-bearing Savior. The fact that we are facing an enemy that's likened to a roaring lion calls for a sword-bearing Savior. And the fact that we, within ourselves, have another law warring against the law of our minds calls for a sword-bearing Savior. See, if a man thinks too, if men think too highly of man, then they will always think too lowly of the Savior. Jesus doesn't have to come with a sword in order to affect political changes. God, heaven has never had trouble dealing with earthly issues. Jesus didn't have to humble himself, become a man, and overcome the world, and be tempted like as we are in all points, yet be without sin. He didn't have to come to earth and do all that in order to make a political change in the, in the earth. He could he'd move around... Uh, men and governments and kings and powers and the weather and geography. He could do all that and did do all that before Jesus ever came. Jesus didn't have to come with a two-edged sword in order to make financial changes. He didn't have to come with a sword in order to change your health. He comes with a sword to save. See, we fallen men don't think like this. They, if we men are we're prone to think too inwardly, too self, too self-centered. What I need, what I am, what I want, what I get, what I have. Jesus comes with a sword because we needed him to come with a sword. He comes with a sword as a savior. He came and he plundered the house of the wicked one. And that's the house that we were in. The strong man's house. He plundered the strong man's house. And he took all that was in the house. He came, he overcame the world. The one with the two-edged sword. He led, in fact, he did this so thoroughly that he just led captivity captive. He didn't just save us from captivity. He just took captivity captive. And by default, he got all the captives has a two-edged sword. That's why he can say, who the son makes free, he's free indeed. <clears throat> the sword that he bears has two edges. The sword, that is, the sword cuts two ways. That is, there's, there's life and death experience when Jesus comes. We die with Jesus so that we can live with Jesus. There's no living with Jesus until we die with Jesus. But no one dies with Jesus and then doesn't live with Jesus. There's life and death in the sword. Yes. See, there's, there's a part of us from Adam that has to die. Yes. And then is when he can give life. Yes. That's the life more abundantly. It's not an enhancement of life. It's a new life that wasn't there before. Yes. It's a, a, the fullness of, of uh, life to the full, fullness of life. That's, that's a life that he gives. He's, Jesus doesn't come and add to what we already have. He comes and gives what we didn't have. Amen. See, it's a two-edged sword. There's, see, there's bitter and sweet in this sword. Just like the book that John ate. It, it, was, it was sweet, and then it became bitter. Have you, we've all had this experience. Now, the, praise the Lord that the sweetness, it outweighs the bitter. It's, it's, it's worth taking the bitter for the sweet because the sweet compensates for the bitter. But there, there is a bitter in the belly when this sword comes, but there's also a sweet. See, there's, there's peace and there's conflict when Jesus comes. 
He comes, he's the prince of peace, but he said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. He didn't come to make peace between men. He came to make peace between God and man. Amen. The effect of that is that, unfortunately, you end up being at odds with some people. Jesus was, was at odds with his own brothers. His own brothers thought he had gone crazy. Tried to come and take him, take him home like he was an embarrassment to the family name. We got to keep him out of public. He was at variance with his own, and his mother came and he and he said, Who, "Who's my mother? Who are my brother? These, whoever does the work, the will of God, these are my mother and my and my brethren." But there's see, there's peace and there's conflict in the in the sword. It's a two-edged sword. It's a two, it's a sword. It's not a machete. <laughs> it gives life. It's also a sword, not a club. He doesn't just come to beat up and bruise, leave you by the side of the road dead. That's what the world will do. That's what the enemy does. Men will do that. But Jesus comes with a two-edged sword. See, so the flesh is discomforted by the sword, and the new man is nourished by the same sword. It's a two-edged sword. The natural man... Is, is held in and hemmed up by the sword. But the inner man is empowered and enabled by the same sword. It's two-edged. It's, two it's a sharp two-edged sword. See, David in the Psalms, he prayed, don't keep silent. Yeah. But then the people at Mount Sinai said, please keep silent. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's a two-edged sword. Okay. It's like we've got some of Israel in us and some of David in us. <laughs> The flesh is saying, no, I don't want any more of this. That, that's what we're mortifying. That's the part that we've got to put off and mortify. But then the spirit says, don't keep, si don't keep silence. Don't, don't stop talking. You see, it's a two-edged sword. Now, what the sword does to you depends on how close you are to the sword bearer. The further you are from the sword bearer, the harder the sword hurts. It's a two-edged sword. But the closer you are to the sword bearer, then the less injury the sword does. It gives life. The closer you are, the more precious the sword is. If the wounds of a friend are faithful, as Solomon said, then the wounds of the Savior are quickening. And there is a wound that needs to be administered. See, the surgeon also comes with sort of a sword. And the Savior comes with a sword. Now a sword in the hand of your enemy means death. But the sword in the hand of your captain means deliverance. Now what is he to you? Well, actually, in a, in a, in a real experiential way, he's both. Because he's the enemy of Adam. But he's, he's, the, he's the father, the eternal father of, the, of, of, the, of his race. And so he, he is both to us. This sword can both condemn and save. And in our case, it's doing, it's doing the same. It's, it's removing and it's bringing in. It's scattering and it's gathering. It's killing and it's giving life, both at, both at the same time. Amen. <clears throat> See, the sword kills and the sword sets free. And oftentimes the same man, the same sword, he... He breaks into the strong man's house and he, he kills and he sets free. That's why he came in. He didn't come in just to kill. He came in to set free. So oftentimes when Jesus was in this world with the same words given at the same scene, the same setting, the same words that he spoke, he would shut the mouths of his enemies and at the same time open the hearts of his sheep. He caused trouble and comfort at the same time. That's a sharp, two-edged sword. The same word that Jesus spoke caused some men to leave everything and follow him. That same word is the word that they killed him for. Some said of this man, to whom else shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Others said, he's mad. Why do you hear him? See, that's the, that's the two edges. It pushes some away. And it drew others in. Sharp, two-edged sword. So that's why the Holy Spirit says there was a division among the people because of him. 
So when we find another law in our members, remember he has a sharp two-edged sword. This is reason to rejoice, not to be not to be scared. Only because of this sword can we say with Paul. Now, let me ask you, have you had this, this Paul experience? We find another law in my members. When I will to do good, I find another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity. Then we rejoice in this two-edged sword because only because of the sword making this division can we say, yet not I but sin that dwells in me. You can't say that in Adam. You can't say, yet not I. You have to own it in Adam. But we don't have to own it in Christ because the sharp two-edged sword has made, a, and made this, this distinction. See, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with what I've found in me. We've, we've, we're given this, this assignment to examine ourselves. Now, people tend to be real good at examining others, right? You need to be... You need to be better at examining yourself. And when I, when I examine myself, I, I find some things that I really don't want to find. And that, that's the wretched man that I am experience. And if you haven't had a wretched man that I am experience, I highly suggest it. It's going it's to be real hard to deny yourself until you have this wretched man that I am experience. Amen. And when you do, you, you'll, you'll get, that you, you start to get some denial traction. You know, when you, wretched man that I am, well, then you, <clears throat> you know what I mean. So, see, we need a sword-bearing Savior. When we find another law, see, he can, he, and really, experientially, he's still making the division. We're not done dealing with Adam yet. There will come a day when we are, that we'll be done dealing with Adam. But see, the, the sword's already cutting. It's already penetrating. It's already making the division. So this church in Revelation chapter 2 has been introduced to him with a sharp, two-edged sword. Knowing who is speaking changes how we hear. The people who, sh who shrugged off what he said and just went on went on their way, just like another day in Jerusalem. It wasn't just like another day in Jerusalem. God had become flesh. It was anything but just another day in Jerusalem. But a lot of people treated it like another, just another day in Jerusalem because they didn't know that he was bearing the sharp two-edged sword. So I, I want to encourage you, brethren, to listen like they did in his hometown. He asked for the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he read... And he said, this day is this, this prophecy fulfilled in your ears. And he sat down. He said, all the eyes of them in the synagogue were fastened on him. Yeah. It's like the, the, the environment was just, was just electric. Yeah. <laughs> they were all their eyes were fastened on him. Well, that, we've, we've got to hear that way. Yeah. We've got to hear him because he's still speaking. Yeah. He hasn't quit reading from the role of the prophet Isaiah. Yeah. He's still He's still doing it today. We need to hear him gladly. Like the, when the, when the common people, they heard him haggling with, the, with Jesus, uh, the, uh, the religious people, they were haggling with Jesus about, about this and about that. And it's like, we got this, you know, we haven't been able to settle this issue. Maybe this man can settle this issue and, and kind of get, uh, get out the toys of the trade, you know, the religious trade. Let's, let's see if Jesus can settle this. And they, they scoffed at his answers. They asked him questions and then he, they scoffed at his answers. And then it says, Luke says, the common people heard him gladly. So I, I recommend that to you. Hear him gladly. Amen. So Jesus said to this, this same church in Revelation 2.16, he said, repent. He, he was introduced to the church as him who has the sharp two-edged sword. And then he, he had diagnosed the, the, the church. And then he said, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Now Jesus is going to, you're going to deal with Jesus. Amen. We can tell every man. We can tell the atheists, you can deny now, but there's coming a day your denial is going to flee and you're going to deal with Jesus. Either the sword is going to quicken you or the sword is going to kill you. The sword is going to be your deliverance or the sword is going to fight against you. Now, Jesus isn't looking for a fight. He died for the church. He doesn't want the fight against the church. But he will if he has to. We either live by every word of God or the word of God fights against us. 
So every person is going to deal with the sword. No one can evade the sword. No one is exempt from the sword. The issue is what will the sword do to you when it comes to you? So Jesus has taken up an aggressive project when he began a good work in me. It's the kind of project that required a sword, a two-edged sword. And his word is up to the work. Amen. It effectually works in you that believe. It effectually worketh also in you that believe. So remember when he says things like peace be still to the, to the storm. That's the sword. And he says, what did you dispute about in the way? They didn't want to answer. That was a sword. When he says, stand up, take your bed and go home. That was the sword. He said, hold your peace and come out of him. That was the sword. He's still bearing the same sword today. So as Gideon raised up the sword and shouted, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, Jesus is today raising up the sword and bringing deliverance. Amen. Amen.